your Bibles this morning, uh, go to uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, you know, if it's not highlighted yet, highlight it because that's sort of like the, the main text or the main scripture of, of this theme and I'm sharing it every week so it gets in you, it says uh, this, so Christ has truly set you free, now make sure that you stay free, now make sure that you stay free, see what Jesus did on the cross He has set you free. But how many know that we can live this life of not living in freedom? We can know that Christ has set us free, but we can do things and habits and and routine and familiarity that can stop us from living free and staying free. (coughs) And so how the question I want to ask to to you today and go through the, the, the Israelites in the wilderness is this question of how... Do we stay free? How do we stay free? Like we need to work out not just that Christ has set us free, but how do we actually stay free? If the Bible mentions it that you've got to stay free, it must be important, right? There's a lot of us that are free of the chains and all the things that Jesus broke off us. But a whole lot of mindsets are still there that are causing us to live still with that slavery mindset. And so there's this... There's this process of of, uh, what we talked about, Moses and the burning bush and him getting a a word from God to help release all his people from captivity, from slavery. And we've gone through that space where now they're walking around the the wilderness. And, you know, when you look at the distance between when they left Egypt and what it was to step into the promised land, it's only 631 kilometers It's not actually that far. It's not that far for them to walk and and press in and go to the promised land. But theologians say it took over 2,000 Ks to get there. It took them 40 years to get to somewhere that God had promised them. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Not necessarily that it took them that long to get there, but because there were speed bumps along the way. There was mindsets that they had to break. There was people that actually had to die off so that they could inherit the promise. We look at, you know, Joshua and Caleb and all these spies that go out and they go to spy out the land and they come back. And we know the story. There's 12 spies and two of them come back with, man, we could take this. This promise is amazing from God. But 10 of them came back and said, no, we look like uh, grasshoppers in their eyes. Like if we, if we take the promise God has for us, then we will surely die. And there's this challenge I think people go through constantly, if, if not on a daily basis, of God's promise and them waking up in the middle of the night or in the morning and saying, hey, today's going to be a good day. There's so much promise for you to step into. But your mind plays a part and you look at the promise with the wrong mindset or the wrong eyes and you start to see all the challenges that come with that. God doesn't want you to just live a comfortable life. What do you say? You've got to give up your life to find life. Like you've got to die to yourself to live for Christ. So it's from the outset, it's not easy. It's not like come follow Jesus and everything's going to go smooth and, and man, it's going to be smooth sailing. Like you'll love it. Like you will love it. But it's also going to be a challenge because Yourself needs to be put to death. We talk about baptism and, and the burial of your old life, and all, everything becomes new when you come out of the waters of baptism. The symbolism of an old life passing away and all things becoming new. It's, it's amazing until you get your first challenge. Oh, got, that's right, I've got to die to myself. Man, that's hard to do. Man, that's hard to walk in. Yeah. Man, it's hard to step in. It's one thing to find freedom. It can be quite another to stay free and live in freedom. <clears throat> the, the Israelites have been set free and God is providing for them in this, in this story. Uh, if you've got your Bibles turned to Numbers chapter 11, we'll get there. But uh, the Israelites are 
They've gone out of slavery and they've stepped into the wilderness, this, this moment between the, what was captivity and what is promise, but they're, all, they're in this moment. And I believe it's a testing time. How much do you trust God that when you're in the wilderness, yes, you're looking to the promise and everything that God has for you, and you could look back and go, man, it looked better back there. Which is what we'll talk about soon. But there's this moment that we get ourselves in, which is quite often, if not every day, that God is testing if we trust Him or not. Do you trust God? The good answer is, yes, I do. The harder answer is, are you walking out that every day? That you trust God in your finances, that you trust yeah. God in those relationships, that you trust God in those because it feels like a wilderness quite often. Because yeah. usually when we get to the promised land, it's like God's well done, good and faithful servant. I don't need you anymore. That's how sometimes it feels like we finally get to the promise. But the promise for us is not a physical promise. It's not a land flowing of milk and honey here on earth. This is an eternity that we get to spend with Jesus. The promise for us. And so if we're, we're not necessarily looking for promises here on earth. Yes, they, they're nice and they help us along the way. Like the cloud, of, um, the cloud by day and the fire by night that leads us in it. And the, the manna that God provides for us to live off every day so that we can access uh, and, and sustain our lives. But that can get boring. As the Israelites found. That can get very mundane. That can get very everyday. It seems like the same. We eat the same stuff. What should we make out of manna today? Oh, we'll make bread. Oh, what, what should we make today? Oh, should we make cake? Oh, what should we, oh let's, let's try muffins. Oh, let's, you know, it's the same stuff, but we're trying to change things a little bit so that we're not stuck in familiarity. And we look at Numbers chapter 11 and... There's a bunch of people within the Israelites, verse 4 to 6. It says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them, the Israelites, yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? Verse 5, We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons. The leeks, the onions, the garlic, oh my gosh. They start reminiscing about the past. They start reminiscing and they start trying to find good things about slavery. There's a multitude within there. Verse 6, but now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. You know, there's a group of people in the story and they start savoring, oh man, the melons, oh, the cucumbers, oh, all of the stuff that, man, the, the fish was amazing there. Maybe we should go back. Like what in your past looks like that at the moment? What in your past when before Christ, when you... When you said, man, I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. The, the manna that I'm having every day does not look like fish. It does not look like melon. It doesn't look like onions. It doesn't look like all the things that we didn't have to really pay for because we didn't even have the money back then. Yes, we were in slavery, but at least we got food. At least we got shelter. At least we knew what every day looked like. Slavery, it's a mindset can play with your mind and you can get caught up in it. It's dangerous when you start craving what's old. When you start craving all the thing that God has set you free from. Who will give us meat to eat? I want to say let's be a, a church that pushes into the promise, not wants to go back to slavery. Like, let's be a church that decides today that, no, we want the promises of God. Whatever that looks like for us, we want to step into the promise. We want to accept and, and agree to walking this journey out to accept everything God has for us. Because it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's everything you could ever ask or dream of. But it's going to take a testing time to get there. Can you stand the test of that time? Can you push through? 
a little bit longer in, in Numbers 11, verse 18 to 20, it says, The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. So God provides quail. Not, not exactly what they had in mind, but it's still meat. You will uh, not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. <laughs> you want blessing? Here you go. You'll have blessing until you hate it. Until you don't want it anymore. That's God saying, I am capable of giving you everything you can ask, think or imagine. But right now, I'm only giving you what you need. Not what you want, but what you need. Because he, they, were, they were after so much more. But actually what they needed was trust in God. How much do you need to trust in God instead of just your needs being met right now? Just trust. Just hold on. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of the chaos, just hold on to God. What in your past do you need to let go of? What are you craving from your past? Just let it go. God is so much more ahead of you than what you're seeing looking backwards. In verse 33 of Numbers 11, it says, But while the meat was still between their teeth, and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people. Oof. You don't want to get to that point in your life. Trust me, it will not be nice. And he struck them with a severe plague. Verse 34. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava. However you say that. Because they were buried. Uh, because there they were buried. Or they buried the people who had craved other food. This word Kibroth Hatava means the graves of those who craved. The graves of those who craved. Whew. That's crazy. That those people didn't, they never got to experience the promise. They were living in the blessing of God. They were living in the freedom of God because they thought, oh, we just set free out of Egypt. But they didn't ever walk into the promise because they were craving the old. They were craving what was back there. And we've got to learn to shake those things off. We've got to learn to shake the cravings off because that's going to get you into trouble. Driving a car, looking at the rear view mirror is going to get you in trouble pretty fast. You need to fix your eyes on Jesus who's the author. He's the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that we set our attention on. Not in the rearview mirror going, okay, God, thank you for the past. Thank you for everything. Actually, that was way better than where I am now. I wish I was living there. You start reminiscing. And the cravings are the... Because why? The enemy is like a prowling lion. He's trying to sow those seeds in you so you go backwards, not forwards. He doesn't want you to live in freedom. So how do we actually stay free? Intimacy. How do you stay free? Intimacy. As we said, it's not what is freedom, it's who is freedom. And freedom has a name and it's Jesus. Intimacy with Him will get you out of every tricky situation you find. It because you're not thinking about mana, quail. Oh, no, I get to spend time with Jesus. The intimacy I'm building with Jesus gets me through a whole lot of situations. Freedom is found in knowing who you are and whose you are. And freedom is kept in following after the one who saved us and keeps on saving you. You know you're not just saved once. A lot of us need to be saved about a million times a day. Because of what we do, because of what we think, because of what we say. And that's just to ourselves, let alone the people around us. So Jesus hasn't just saved you. He's still saving you. It's a process. 
It's an ongoing thing that Jesus has promised you that He will save you. His forgiveness never runs out. His forgiveness never runs dry. His love to you never runs dry. No matter what you do, He'll keep running back to you and picking you up. Why did we ever leave Egypt? That's what the people said. Why did we ever leave Egypt? Why are we following this madman Moses? Like he's talking to burning bushes. That's just crazy, right? How do we know it was God? How do we know that he's had an encounter with the real God and not just like a burning bush in the middle of the desert by himself? <clears throat> and we start questioning all these things. But the greatest thing that will overcome those thoughts you have is your own personal intimacy with God. The greatest thing is when you've got kindred spirits and you and you you just like got a faith journey and you're like, man, God, I don't know if I should step out this, and you put it out there, and then people's spirits leap. And it's like, oh man, like, are you in on this? It's like, yeah, let's do it. It's like, how crazy is this? For us to move to Topol, it was like, I was like, nah, I'm, I'm not keen. <clears throat> and then it, I thought it must have been God because Teddy was like, oh, I really feel like we should go. Like, that's always when, when, the, when the wife's on board, it's just like a no-brainer, let's do it. <laughs> because I'm usually the one that goes, come on, let's, like, I'm leading my family, let's go here, let's go here, let's go here. And I was like wrestling with this idea of moving to a place that we didn't really know anyone, we, we didn't really want to step into that. It was like, oh, there's so many unknowns, God, I don't know. It just seems like a wilderness and I'm not keen for a wilderness. I'd rather step into the promise. But the wilderness prepares you for the promise. How you trust God in the wilderness is how you trust God in the promise. How you trust God to push you through everything yeah. is challenges every single day. It's a challenge now. You can listen to this or you can disregard it. It's not my words. This is Bible words. Why did we ever leave Egypt? I got stuck on that all week. How God? But these people got to see miracles like with their eyes they got to experience they got to live in the blessing of it but got stuck i shared in prayer meeting this morning john chapter 6 verse 66 right 666 it talks about after there's so many miracles and jesus walked on water and all this miracles and everyone saw it it said the disciples didn't want to follow jesus anymore not the 12 that we know, but disciples. There were so many people that were following Jesus. And many of them left and didn't want to follow Jesus anymore. John chapter 6, verse 66. You can look it up. But then Jesus has the nerve to look at the 12 disciples. And he says, what about you? Are you going to? He's not trying to stop all the disciples leaving. He just says, oh, well, that's their choice. What about you guys? Are you on board or you, you want to go too? And Peter's response, he looks at him and he says, where else are we going to go? <laughs> Who else are we going to hang out with? But like, we believe you. We believe you're the son of God. We believe everything you've done. We believe you're the one that's been prophesied about. Jesus has this like question to his disciples and Peter has this revelation, which later on Jesus actually says, you are Peter and on this rock, this revelation, I will build my church. But isn't that the same disciples that one of them betrayed him? Yeah. That didn't even get to step into the promise because he, he committed suicide? Judas? Peter denies him three times. The same Peter that had this revelation that I'm going to stay with you forever. Before the cock crows, you were going to deny me three times. There's challenges in your life. There's challenges all through the Bible that yet these people went through so that we can relate because we go through the same stuff. 
it's easy to say to God in this environment, God, I'll never leave you. Man, I'm with you forever. Till the first challenge comes outside of this wall, and then you're like, nope, Jesus, nah, I've never heard of him. Nah. Peter. One of the closest people to Jesus that saw it and, and experienced everything, yet still denied him. You, you and I think we're higher than that? <laughs> nah, nah, I'll be good. Me and Jesus are tight. But no, we still get that space. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Intimacy with Christ, getting close to the Holy Spirit, He is the one that produces those things in our life. He's the one that guides us. The Holy Spirit was sent to us as a helper. When was the last time you engaged the Holy Spirit as your helper? Like, that's an actual question. When, when was the last time... And it wasn't just, God, I need the bills paid this week. But it actually, the helper means so much more than that. He's helping you connect to the Father. He's helping you to connect to the promises that God has for you. Not just to, to go in front of you and sweep. Yeah, here comes royalty. No, He's there to help you process everything in your life as a helper. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Ooh. Why did we ever leave Egypt? You'd probably be like me and go, what idiots? Like why are these why am I reading this stuff about people in the Bible that just doubted? Because I doubt. Why were they fearful? Oh, because I'm fearful. Why are they dealing with insecurities when they're walking with Jesus? Oh, because I deal with insecurities. And now it relates to me, and I'm like, man, God, if they can do it, I can do it. That's they didn't have money. They were whipped. They were making bricks and straws. They were killing their children, yet they wanted to go back because of the fish. Like, they looked past all the chaotic stuff about slavery, and they thought, oh, the fish. <laughs> You look at all of those things that encapsulate slavery and yet you still want the fish. There's things in your past that yes look like, oh those are amazing. Those gourmet fish that you ate whatever years ago. Imagine if we just went back there. It's not worth it. You're still in slavery. Break out of it by spending time with the Holy Spirit. By breaking familiarity off your life. Stay focused on moving forward in what God has for you. This, I was reading again just the Galatians 5 being the, the main sort of passage for our, our freedom series. And, and I got to the fruit of the Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that produces these things. It's not things that we can just squeeze a little bit tighter and then love will pop up and then joy will pop up. No, the Holy Spirit, the intimacy we have with Him, He's the one that produces these things in our life. So if you're not living with the Holy Spirit attached or part of or involved in everything you do, then He's not producing these things. So it's not trying to grab the old love that you had last week. It's engaging with Holy Spirit this week and Him producing a new love. Him producing a new joy. Him producing the best one we can find, which is self-control. Oh, joy. Because it says, but the Holy Spirit produces the, uh, this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Anyone need some peace? Yeah. We all need these things, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. But it's the Holy Spirit that produces these things in our life. 
The fact that he produces them no. means that if you pluck one no, no, off no. the tree, you need to next week go back to another that tree and pluck another one. Because if you pull an apple off a tree, the apple isolated is going to eventually deteriorate. And it's going to be insignificant for next week. Look at my fruit drawer and my boys. If they don't eat the apples in, their, like, in a week, they're not touching them again. And so when I look in the natural at how things can deteriorate, I think, and I've got to keep going back to that tree. I've got to keep my joy relevant. I've got to keep my, my love up to date. I've got to keep my self-control up to date. I've got to keep going back to the tree. I've got to build intimacy with the Holy Spirit so He can produce these things in my life. Not just a one-off go to the orchard and pick off one thing for everything. That'll, that'll be me for the year. No, every day, every week, those things are going to deteriorate and you're going to need a fresh perspective on it. You're going to need to step into it at a greater level. But it's the Holy Spirit that produces that kind of fruit. I'm, I'm convinced that Jesus didn't just come to make bad people good. Right? That's not his aim. Okay, just if you feel like you're a bad person, he's not just trying to make you good. I believe Jesus came to make dead people live. Because without Christ, you, you're pretty much just a zombie. You're, you're a dead person because there's no fruit being produced. There's nothing happening in your life without that intimacy with God. Without that relationship with Jesus. That's why it's great in these settings, man, I love it. But this is still, at some level, a second-hand revelation. You are capable of getting your own first-hand revelation. Like, I spend time during the week to, to get what God wants to share so that we can really go down that line of, man, God, you are speaking fresh from heaven. From I don't just Google a message around the place and go, oh, that'll, that'll work, hopefully. So, man, God, I, I want to I wanna share something that's straight hot off the press from you. And so when I'm praying into services, like I'm praying over you that your heart would be right, your mind would be right to receive what God wants to share to you today. And so I'm, I'm praying and hoping that, that something of today will, will reach out to you and reach into your spirit and allow you to go, man, I need to keep going back to that tree. I need to keep plucking off new fruit. If not weekly, daily. Spend time with God. Build that relationship. Build that intimacy. Just like a marriage. You've got to work on your intimacy. You've got to work on that time spent together because that's what solidifies a relationship. Flatmates are totally different. People that are just living in the same house that don't have a relationship. And often we're like that with God. We only talk to Him when we need the dishes done because, oh, come on, flatmate, you've left your dishes out. Oh, you need a vacuum. It's your turn on the roster. Oh, it's like God wants to engage at a deeper level with you. And what's going to break all of those things, what's going to help you stay free is that intimacy. It's that space where you have with God outside of everything else. I, I still, it boggles my mind that people have seen things yet now don't believe. Like yet want the cravings and, and, and the cravings of the sinful nature within you wants to go back to that. I, it boggles my mind because I'm like, God, I, I always want just what you have for me. I want to live in that space. Where God, you've got so much more for me than what I've been through already. Got so much more. I was born for this. I was born to make the devil nervous. You were born to make the devil nervous. When you get on fire for God, there's a rumbling in hell. Because they're going, oh man, we need to watch out for him. We need to watch out for her because they are now dangerous. They actually believe what God is saying. 
and they can do far greater than they could think, ask, dream, imagine. But it's not because of what we can do. It comes back to that intimacy with God. And it's in Him that we find our strength. It doesn't matter if you're weak. Because in your weakness, He can make, be made strong. So maybe go find all your weaknesses and go, God, I invite you into those spaces. God, I'm really weak at talking to people, God, but I want to branch out this week and I want to have a conversation with someone. I want to be able to share the love of Jesus with someone for them to articulate it in a way that it's like, man, how have I never heard the gospel before? How have I never heard that Jesus loves me, but you took time out of your day, took time out of your month to just sit with me and explain how Jesus has changed your life and how Jesus can change my life. You don't need to articulate the, the gospel message by every scriptural reference. You've got a testimony of Jesus changing your own life. Just start there. Or is the question, has Jesus really changed your life? Or is that just a mask that you can put on on Sunday? Yep, this is my Jesus changed my life. Yep, man, look at me on Sunday worshiping. Woo! But then I've got to leave that here and I've got to take it off because it doesn't match up to my life during the week. And what breaks that mask is the intimacy you can have with God. Why? Because He reveals who He is and then He reveals who you are. And you are a child of God. Every chain being broken. Every chain broken off you right now. Last week I talked about shame. I talked about names. I talked about blame being, being taken off you. God wants to take those things off you. Not shame on you. Shame off you. Jesus and what He did on the cross wants to set you free. But not just on a one-off. He wants you to stay free. I don't want to give you a three-point sermon and a fancy thing of trying to say these are the practical ways of trying to stay free. There's only one, intimacy with the Holy Spirit, intimacy with God, a relationship with God will ground you and He will be able to produce fruit in you. That's all you need. You don't need all the things on your shopping list that you keep telling God. He says, hey, let's just hang out. Let's just spend time together. Let's just build our relationship. Maybe that's five minutes. Maybe that's half an hour. Maybe that's more. You decide how much you can really engage with God. The Bible says in James, it says that when you draw near to God, He draws near to you. That's a promise. Promise from God. Amen?